Here we go. Make sure it's on. Right, just one more thing. Okay, hopefully we get a few more people. So we'll start the Bhagavad Gita class for this evening. First we'll chant Jai Radha Madhava. <clears throat> Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunya Bihari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunya Bihari Gopi Jana Malabha Iri Vardha Huti Gopi Jana Malabha Giddy Bada Dahuti Yashoda Nanda Navraja Jana Ranjata Yashoda Nanda Navraja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Bada Chari Yamuna Tira Bada Chari Jaya Radhu Madhuva Kunja Bihari Jaya Radhu Madhuva Kunja Bihari Kopi Jana Malabha Giri Bharadhaguti Kopi Jana Malabha Giddy Bardad Hathi Yashoda Nandana Raja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Raja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Ranhumad Uva Kunja Bihati Jaya Ranhumad Uva Kunja Bihati Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Paravidagacharya Also tell us it is she his divine grace, Abhaya Channa, Bhaktivedanta, Gosami, Shila, Prabhupada, Vijay. Iskan founder Acharya, Shila Prabhupada, Vijay. Ananta Goti, Vaishna, Vrindi, Vijay. Namacharya, Shila Huila, Stakur, Vijay. Brem, Zay, Kaho, Shri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nichananda. She had way to get out, ha, she busted the gold, Bhaktivedanta, Vijay. She, she, Radha Krishna. Go pick up the Siam Kunda, Radakunda, Giddy Go Radi Kijai, Vrinda, Vidam Kijai, Maturam Kijai, Jagadatha Sami Kijai, Yamunamai Kijai, Shimati Talasi Devi Kijai, Samaveda Bhakta, Vrinda Kijai, Go, Vrindananda, Hari Hari Go. All glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees. All glories, the assembled devotees. All glories to Shri Guru and Gauranga, Srila Prabhupada, Kijai, Gaur Prabhananda. So, Om Gana Tunaranda Shah, Gananjana Shalakya Chakshur, Meditam Yena Tazmai, Shigaray Maha. We offer our respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of our spiritual master, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who so kindly opened our eyes with a torchlight of knowledge while we were blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So today we will continue with our Bhagavad Gita class from the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, and we're going to continue with text nine. 
clear the screen so I can see it better. So, uh, okay. Punyo Ganda Pritivyam Cha Tejas Chasmi Vibhasa Jivanam Sarva Bhuteshu Tapas Chasmi Tapas Vishu Punya, original, Gandaha, fragrance. Pritivyam in the earth, Cha also. Teja, heat, Cha also. Asmi, I am. Vibhava Sao, in the fire, Jivanam, life. Sarva in all, Bhuteshu, living entities, Tapaha, penance, Cha also, Asmi, I am, Tapashvishu, and those who practice penance. Krishna says, I am the original fragrance of the earth, I am the heat and fire, I am the life of all that lives, and I am the penances of all ascetics. Ascetics are people who are very austere. <laughs> And they perform penances. So in, this, in other words, Krishna is saying he's everything. So Krishna is trying to point out how we can see him everywhere and everything in him. And uh, as he says in the sixth chapter of the Gita, which we went through already, text 30, that one who sees me in everything and everywhere is never lost to me, nor am I ever lost to him. So punya means that which is not decomposed. Punya is original. Everything in the material world has a certain flavor or fragrance, as the flavor and fragrance in a flower or in the earth, in water, in fire, in air, etc. The uncontaminated flavor, the original flavor, which permeates everything, is Krishna. Similarly, everything has a particular original taste, and this taste can be changed by the mixture of chemicals. So everything original has, come, has some smell, some fragrance, and some taste. You bow a soul means fire. Without fire, we cannot run factories, we cannot cook, etc., and that fire is Krishna. The heat in the fire is Krishna, according to Vedic medicine. Indigestion is due to a low temperature in the belly. Hmm. Uh, it's called Jamagni, which means the fire of digestion. Prabhupada said, if you have a strong fire of digestion, you can eat nails, basically. So even for digestion, fire is needed. In Krishna consciousness, we become aware that earth, water, fire, air, and every active principle, all chemicals and all material elements are due to Krishna. The duration of man's life is also due to Krishna. Therefore, by the grace of Krishna, man can prolong his life or diminish it. Wow, that comes as a surprise. So Krishna consciousness is active in every sphere. So let me explain what that means as far as prolonging your life, because I'm sure you all want to prolong your life. So, uh, if you are not Krishna conscious, you have a certain number of breaths and heartbeats, and after that, it's all over, buddy. You're finished. And if you are Krishna conscious, then it's determined by Krishna, when Krishna wants to take you. <laughs> so, it's always by the grace of Krishna. Actually, the statement is even in spite of the best medical care, the best doctors and everything, the patient can die if Krishna doesn't want. And sometimes in spite of the worst medical care, no doctors, whatever, if Krishna wants the patient will survive. So Krishna consciousness is active in every sphere. Uh, text 10. Bijamam sarvabhutanam vidi parta sanatanam budir budi matam asme. Tejas tejas vinam aham. Bijam the seed, mam the sarvabhutanam of all living entities. Vidi, try to understand partho son of Buddha. Sanatanam, original, eternal. Buddhi, intelligence. Buddhimatam of the intelligent, as me, I am. Tejaha, prowess. Tejas vinam of the powerful, aham, I am. O oh, Sanaprita, know that I am the original seed of all existences, the intelligence of the intelligent, because that's super soul, and the prowess of all powerful men. So in other words, whatever intelligence, power, beauty, knowledge that we have is all on loan from God. <laughs> that's true. And when God wants to take back what he has loaned to us, 
no intelligence, no strength, no prowess, no beauty, no nothing. <laughs> so that indicates our uh, complete dependence on Krishna. That's the point. So a devotee is completely dependent on Krishna, which utilizes your God-given abilities, beauty, whatever it is, but realize it's coming from Krishna. That way you remain humble. I was asked the question today in an email exchange with a devotee, and this particular devotee uh, saw some atheists who were extremely humble. They uh, were supposedly exhibiting the uh, symptoms of Trinata peace and each and they were atheists. So this devotee was bewildered. How can an atheist exhibit those qualities? <clears throat> and my answer was <clears throat> that those qualities can be exhibited temporarily by an atheist. Sure. For someone who has no connection with God. Sure. Because that's what we know about the three modes of nature. That the three modes of nature, let me turn my phone off, the three modes of nature are in continual flux, I mean, comp competing for control over the living entity. And sometimes, uh, sometimes the mode of goodness becomes prominent, even for a long period of time. Then one is very kind and loving and peaceful and compassionate. It's true. You know, even a tiger can sometimes be influenced partially by the mode of ignorance. Because naturally, they're in the mode of passion. I mean, I'm mode of goodness. So sometimes they're naturally in the mode of passion and ignorance. But sometimes, you know, the mode of goodness may overcome. You know. And then when the mode of passion and ignorance comes, they bite off your head. So that's why it's described in the Bhagavatam. Uh, was it Yashasti Bhakti Bhagavacha Kinchana Savar Kamas Tatra Samasati Sura Arava Bhaktacha Gato Mahajuna Manorite Nasati Dabato Bahi. But one who is Krishna conscious naturally exhibits all these good qualities because they're part of his constitutional nature. Those good qualities, like kindness, compassion, tolerance, they're all part of our nature. But when our nature gets covered up, then other qualities manifest. So if for some time our nature is covered up by the mode of goodness, then we appear to have those wonderful qualities, but it's only temporary. Whereas a devotee is always exhibiting those qualities. That's the difference. Stability. <clears throat> That's why this verse says, Arabha Bhaktasya Kato Mahatguna. That someone who is not God conscious, someone who is just like an atheist or something like that, then their so-called good qualities are only on the mental platform. In other words, it's temporary, you're seeing things happening, and you're interpreting like that, but they're not actually good qualities. Because they're not coming from the soul, they're coming from the mode of nature. You know, even a wild animal, if somehow or other you play some like motive, goodness, music, for a wild animal, they become pacified for some time. And then, back to their original nature. So, that's important to understand. Bija means seed. Krishna is the seed of everything. There are various living entities, movable and inert. Birds, beasts, men, and many other living creatures are moving living entities. Trees and plants, however, are inert. They cannot move, but only stand. Every entity is contained within the scope of 8,400,000 species of life. Some of them are moving, and some of them are inert. In all cases, however, the seed of their life is Krishna. As stated in Vedic literature, Brahmana, the supreme absolute truth, is that from which everything is emanating. That's a very important statement. Uh, that everything comes from the absolute truth. Uh, that's the statement of the Nanta Sutra. That's the statement in the Sriman Bhagavatam. Uh, Krishna is Param Brahma, the Supreme Spirit. Brahman is impersonal, and Parabrahman is personal. Parabrahma means the Supreme Brahman. <laughs> That's basically what it means. Are above the topmost Brahman. So, uh, impersonal Brahman is situated in the personal aspect. 
that is stated in the Bhagavad Gita. In other words, Krishna has his personal, he is his personal aspect, and the impersonal Brahman is a manifestation or an expansion of that personal aspect. Therefore, originally Krishna is the source of everything, he is the root. As the root of all of a tree maintains the whole tree, Krishna being the original root of all things maintains everything in this material manifestation. This is also confirmed in the Vedic literature in Katha Upanishad 2 to 13. This verse we also recited yesterday. Nicho nicho nam chetanas chetana nam eko baho nam yo vidadati kama. He is the prime eternal, the original eternal, amongst all eternals. He is the supreme living entity of all living entities. And he alone is maintaining all life. So what this verse says is there is many eternals, but there is one supreme eternal. There's many living entities, and there's one supreme living entity. And that supreme living entity is maintaining all the plural living entities. And that supreme living entity is Krishna. One cannot do anything without intelligence. And Krishna also says he is the root of all intelligence. Unless a person is intelligent, he cannot understand the Supreme Personality of God, of Krishna. Also in the 15th chapter of the Gita, which we'll get to eventually, text 15, uh, Krishna states, cha," that I am seated in the heart of everyone. Sarvasya chaham hridi sanavishto. Sarvasya chaham, I am all ridi in the heart of all living entities. And what am I doing in the heart of all living entities? I'm giving everybody intelligence, remembrance, and forgetfulness according to their desire. So if you want to forget Krishna, Krishna gives you forgetfulness of him. Krishna gives you intelligence how to forget him. Krishna gives you a philosophy that helps you forget him. Krishna is the best atheist because where do you think Atheistic philosophies come from. As Krishna says, I'm the intelligence of the intelligent. So if someone is an atheist, that means, and they're intelligent atheists, not just some dumb uh, hokey from Pinocchio or something like that. Anyway, not to offend anybody. But if someone is an intelligent atheist, that philosophy to be an atheist comes from Krishna. So Krishna is the best atheist, even. Of course, he's not really an atheist, but he comes up with the best atheistic arguments, which he allows to be defeated by the best theistic arguments. And so here we go. We're talking about strength now. Balam balavatam chaham kamaraga vivarchatam dharma virudo bhuteshu kamasmi varatashava balam strength balavatam of the strong cha and aham I am. Kama, passion, raga, and attachment, vivarjatam, devoid of dharma, avaruda. Not against religious principles. Uteshu in all beings, kama, sex life, as me, I am. Varata, rishaba, O Lord of the Bharatas. I am the strength of the strong, devoid of passion and desire. I am sex life, which is not contrary to religious principles, O Lord of the Bharatas, Arjuna. Purport. The strong man's strength should be applied to protect the weak, not for personal aggression. Similarly, sex life according to religious principles, dharma, should be for the propagation of children, not otherwise. The responsibility of parents is then to make their offspring Krishna conscious. And of course, we have the statement by Lord Rishabhadev that no one should become parents unless they can make their offspring Krishna conscious. At least if they're human beings. I mean, animals have a right to become parents without making their offspring Krishna conscious. But human beings, what's this sense of having a litter of cats and dogs? And in modern society, most of the kids are cats and dogs in human bodies. And don't tell that to the parents. And they're worse than cats and dogs because they're doing things that cats and dogs would never do. You know, at least, let's say, generally the animals have a season for sex life, but the human beings don't. Anyway, I can get into all these details, but I'm sure it's not the time, place, and circumstance. So, next verse. 
Vichaiva Satika Baba Rajasas Tamasashta Ye Mata Ive Titan Didi Natwa Hum Te Shute Mai Ye all which Cha and Eva certainly Satikaha in goodness, Babaha, states of being, Rajasaha in the mode of passion, Tamasaha in the mode of ignorance, Cha also, Ye all which Mataha from me, Eva certainly, Iti thus, Tan those, Vidi try to know, Na not to but Aham I Teshu in them, Te be Mai and me. Know that all states of being, be they of goodness, passion, or ignorance, are manifested by my energy. I am in one sense everything, but I am independent. I am not under the modes of material nature, for they, on the contrary, are within me. So in other words, Krishna is the creator of everything. He is the creator of all these three modes, but he's not under their jurisdiction. Just like the boss in a particular factory does not have to report to the boss. Because <laughs> he has no one above him. So everybody else in the factory has managers or divisional managers, but the boss does not report to anybody. I mean, obviously the government, but that's another subject matter. But let's just take the uh, factory as being completely separate from the society. He's the boss. That's it. And everyone has to report to him. So it's the same thing. So purport, all material activities in this world are being conducted under the three modes of material nature. Although these material modes of nature are emanations from the Supreme Lord Krishna, he is not subject to them. For instance, under the state laws, one may be punished, but the king, the lawmaker, is not subject to that law. So here's a political statement. Unfortunately, uh, the king in America <laughs> is thinking he's not subject. To the law and basically getting away with murder. The murdering actually so many Americans uh, by his negligence. Whew. Terrible. Anyway, so in a monarchy, a good king would not be subject to the law. However, if a good king became a bad king, he would be day. Deposed. I know it's deposed. He would be deposed by the Brahmanas. They would have a coup. What do I mean by coup? A rebellion. And how would they do that rebellion? There would be no fighting, no terrorism. They would simply chant some mantras. And by those mantras, poof, the king would be gone. And there's that interesting story. About once upon a time, there was a king, his name was Fena, and he was really bad. He was telling everybody, basically, he was God. And he was harassing the citizens, doing so many horrible things. Of course, he did keep the criminals under uh, control. So what happened is the Brahmanas got together, and they chanted some mantras, and poof, the king, Fena, died. So there are checks and balances in the Vedic system, but through mantras. And so the king passed away, and then there was no king, and there were a lot of problems. There was criminals, terrorists, and everything like that. And so the Brahmanas decided to clone a new king. So this process of cloning is not something that's new. It was known in the Vedic culture, and it was done in quite a sophisticated fashion. So they took some of the genetic material out of the old king, because, you know, the old king had some kingly qualities, you know, these Ishwara Baba. He liked to control, but a lot of demoniac qualities. So you got to, when you're uh, cloning someone, you got to take out the bad genes. You can't remain with the bad genes and the good genes, otherwise you get just a carbon copy of the person. So the Brahmanas were very expert. They did this genetic engineering, going into the DNA and separating little strands with mantras, not with big, big machines, scientific instruments, anything like that. They had mantras to do that. And so the uh, bad genes were actually uh, manifest as a different person, you know, separate the people. And the good genes, they became a great king. 
And they even use those genes to produce the king's wife. That story is there in the Bhagavatam. That's pretty good. You get two, actually you get three for the price of one gene. Or not one gene. But one, uh, one nucleus of a cell. That's pretty good. So anyway, so uh, in that particular case, the reason I told the story is that the king in the Vedic culture was not absolute in the sense that he could do anything and everything and get away with it. There were checks and balances. The brahmanas, those who had no conflicts of interest. Why do I say they had no conflicts of interest? Because they weren't getting a salary. Now it's interesting, because I'm usually referring to the political situation in America, please forgive me. But it's interesting that you have the so-called brahmanas now who are working for the government who get big salaries. And they are working, a lot of them, the ones I'm referring to right now, are working in the different health departments in the United States government, like CDC, the Center of Disease Control, etc., like that. And so they have these big positions. They're doctors, and Brahmins, so to speak. Not really Brahmins, but, you know, it's a Brahminical profession. And so they know that the executive head, who cannot be named, is actually misrepresenting, lying, changing the facts, the medical facts about coronavirus. It's a fact. Coming up with his own facts. And they are not, they are careful not to contradict him. Why? Those big, fat paychecks that they're getting big positions. If someone was actually a Brahmin, one would always speak the truth, even if it meant not getting that big fat paycheck. But it just amazes me so many times examining the present hmm, political situation on all levels, how people are not displaying any sort of honesty because they have their own interests, conflicts of interests, it says. You know, money talks, everybody else walks. So that's why a Brahmin, a real Brahmin, has to be detached from any other sort of interest to be able to give good advice. I mean, in India, of course, you have this famous person, Chanakya Pandit. King didn't accept his advice, he left. He didn't care. Why? Because he was living in a grass hut. He did not take money from the king and live high on the hog. So that's what we need in society. But unfortunately, the people who are supposed to be brahmanas, like the doctors, they're just like, I mean, not say every doctor, but many of them, perhaps the majority, they're interested in moolah. For those of you who don't know what moolah is, I'll translate it from the Sanskrit. It means money. For example, before this whole coronavirus thing happened, many hospitals had quotas for doctors how many heart operations they would have to perform, if they were a heart surgeon. And so there are so many bypass operations that were performed by doctors that were unnecessary. The people could have been taken care of through less invasive means. But money is the honey, as Prabhupada said. So therefore, they use their patients as means of acquiring money uh, and not following the Hippocratic oath of do no harm. Like that. So, so therefore, society needs people like that, advisors to the king, or president have to be completely equal poised and without conflicts of interest to give good advice. Otherwise, they're thinking of themselves, they're thinking of their families, they're thinking of so many other things, and you know, out of their mouths come so many untruths. And they kiss the behind of the political leaders.
That's true. It's actually happening. We had so many blank, 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 blank kissers who are running the government. Well, we usually call them brown noses. Sorry for the language, but you know, it is a fact. So, so anyway, getting back to the point, the king is not independent in the Vedic system, but you know, he can speed in his car and he doesn't have to worry about getting a ticket, certain things like that. Similarly, all the modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance are emanations from the Supreme Lord Krishna. But Krishna is not subject to material nature. Therefore, he is near guna, which means that these gunas or modes, although issuing from him, do not affect him. This is one of the special characteristics of Bhagavan, of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's not under the law. You are, I am, and Krishna isn't. He's Swarat. Swarat means he's independent. Don't try to be independent. Next one. Tribir Gunamayar Babar Ebi Sarvamidam Jagat Momitam Navijanati Mami Bya Paramaviyam. Tribi, three, Gunamayi, consisting of the Gunas. Babai, by the states of being. Ebihi, all these. Sarvam, whole, dumb, this, jagat, universe. Mohitam, deluded, na, abhijanati. Does not know, ma, me, abhiha, above these, param, the supreme, abhiyam, inexhaustible. Translation, deluded by the three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance, the whole world doesn't know me, who am above the modes and inexhaustible. So these three modes are all pervasive, pervasive and they are filtering our consciousness, keeping us from seeing the nose in front of our face. It was Krishna, the Krishna, not the nose, but you know, they're using that metaphor right there. Seeing the obvious, that Krishna is there. The amazing thing, as Prabhupada said, is not that we can see Krishna. The amazing thing is that people don't see Krishna. And it's simply because of the covering. Krishna is never covered. We are covered. And we are covered because we want to be covered. Our fault. You're to blame. The prophet actually said, he said, don't blame Krishna for the material world. You have created the material world. Not in a mechanistic sense that we have created this world. But we have created this world by our desire. Just like the prisoner, the criminal. He is the one who has created the prison house. By his activities. The necessity for the prison house. If there were no criminals, there would be no necessity for a prison house. Simple as that. So, the cause, you know, in one sense, the cause of this material world is the living entity's rebellion towards the Supreme Personality of God. So don't blame Krishna for this material world. It's like a criminal blaming the government for the prison house. Stupid. So the whole world is enchanted by the three modes of material nature. Those who are bewildered by these three modes cannot understand that transcendental to this material nature is the Supreme Lord Krishna. Every living entity under the influence of material nature has a particular type of body and a particular type of psychological and biological activities accordingly. Tell me all about it. It's a fact. I mean, phew. There's so many varieties. Of course, you've got those, all these varieties of life, life 8,400,000, but Within each and every one of those species, you've got unlimited variety. Just like you take the three modes of nature and you go three by three, by three, by three, three to the nth power, and you get a frankly unlimited variety. Let me use that exponent there. So there's mixtures, like the colors. I mean, basically, if we had more refined sight, we could distinguish almost unlimited colors because, you know, you take... Uh, a different fraction of each of the three primary colors, and you get a different color. But really, we're sort of limited as to how many colors we can distinguish, and I don't know. And there's colors, there's shades, like that. There's intensity. So there are four classes of men functioning in the three material modes of nature. This is Varnashram again, which you spoke about before. Uh, those who are purely in the mode of goodness are called Brahmanas. So Brahmana. Uh, is, some of the Dhammas, 
Tapal so chum shanti raja vame vicha yana vigana masti kya karma karma subhavajam. So the quality of a Brahman, mentioned in the Gita, is he's equipoised, self controlled. Even though something may make him angry, he doesn't punch. <laughs> he must hold himself. I mean, we all experience that, that sometimes things get really rile us up. Yet, very rarely, at least for me, do I ever punch anyone. It's been a long time. So, that's a Brahman. The pot, when a Brahman's austere, doesn't accept more than required, clean, uh, studies Vedic literatures, and is very, just a very uh, punctual in everything he does. That's a Brahman. You can actually set your clock by a Brahman. Those are purely in the mode of passion. They're called Kshatriya. Kshatriyas means like uh, kings or princes or soldiers or administrators, etc. Because they're in a passion. They're really romantic. <laughs> Brahmins are definitely not romantic. I mean, sorry. For a Brahmin, be romantic is basically impossible. It's just like, get out your body. You know, if a Brahmin is married and his wife asks him, do I look good? Here. He'll say, your body is simply composed a bile, mucus, air, or the earth, water, fire, air, ether. So, you know, what is this, looking good or looking bad? It's, we're equal. You know, a lump of stool is the same as your body. <laughs> anyway, that's a Brahman's vision. Everything's Krishna's energy, you know, and so he doesn't distinguish so much. You know, he knows the utility, but he doesn't distinguish. It's not very good for someone to be romantic in that particular mode of nature. So romance comes in the mode of passion. Shatris are very romantic. And they fall in love all the time. Of course, uh, in the traditional Vedic system, they, uh, Shatri would have many wives, and sometimes there were women with many husbands, or five husbands like the Pandavas. So, that's a Shatriya. Shatriya, but a Brahman... One wife is, you know, it's kind of enough. Or no wives, you yeah, know, it's okay too. So, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> so with a Kshatriya, he would take care of all of his wives. He's very much protected because the word Kshatriya means one who protects others from harm. So if he was a king or if he's the president, whatever, he's thinking how to do the best for everyone in the kingdom and he considers everyone in the kingdom to be like his children, Praja, those who are born in the kingdom. Even the animals, he protects the animals. Like Maharaj Brikshad, he saw uh, a person named Kali who was uh, torturing a bull and a cow, and Maharaj Brikshad got ready to kill the person who was torturing the bull and the cow because he understood justice should be there, even for the animals. <coughs> Very important principle. So those who are in the modes of passion and ignorance mixed. They're called vices. You know, vices are also... Romantic, they like to dress with a lot of jewelry. It was like there was uh, one lady who was a teacher, and she was teaching her students that if you dress up really nicely with a lot of jewelry, and then it makes the atmosphere very auspicious. So that's, sorry about that, that's a vaisha. Vices like that. Yeah, that's normal. There's nothing wrong with it. And the Vaisha likes to take care of the cows. They like to work uh, in commerce. You know, generally they have a big bank account. And Prabhupada said, if you have a big bank account, you don't let anyone else know how much is in the bank. But you always keep a lot of money if you're a Vaisha. Gold. Gold. You must have a lot of gold. Or money. So that's a Vaisha. Those, <laughs> this is a funny explanation of the mode of the Varnashram system. Those who are completely in ignorance are called Shudras. So they're in ignorance, so you really got to keep them engaged in something practical 
Because as soon as you give them money, what do they do? They get drunk. They go out to prostitution. They take drugs. And money just like burns a hole in their pockets. The vices love to save money. But the shudras, you can give them that. I've seen this. Some of the workers that we're dealing with. You give them a paycheck on Friday. And the money is gone by Saturday morning. And then they're calling up their boss. Asking for an advance on the next week's paycheck. I saw that in Fiji with certain people. You know, and, and so you've got all these different uh, places that give loans, paycheck loans or whatever, advances on paychecks. Uh, or you can leave some of your earthly goods with them and you get a loan on it at a high interest rate. I remember in Fiji there was one of our People used to make money from these shooters. He would, uh, let's say, loan money at the rate of over 20% per month to people. And he got away with it. So that's what a shooter is. They're in ignorance. So better they don't have money. Better they're giving the necessities of life. Better they're taken care of nicely. But it's really difficult to give them money. You know, but that's what do they do with it? Drugs, intoxication, illicit sex, wasting, gambling. Oh, I forgot about gambling. Mating, you know, all these things. So we have to understand, what are the qualities of each individual? What are you? And situate yourself accordingly. Whether you have the qualities of a Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. You don't have to labor yourself like that, but understand. What are your qualities? And we all have those qualities. And every one of those personalities in the different modes of nature can go back to God just by doing the work for Krishna. Just like even the Shudras. Even the Shudras. Unfortunately, in modern society, the Shudras are the ones being worshipped. We're not talking about church. We are talking about the actors, dramatists, musicians in material society. And they, you know, they're being worshipped. And unfortunately, the uh, administrative leaders are shooters, or less, actually, they're less than shooters. Because the shooter is actually within the Varnashram system, but they're actually people outside of the Varnashram system. Uh, and that's modern society. Of course, the statement is Kalo Shudra Sambhava, that everybody in Kali Yuga is a Shudra, and by the proper association, they can rise to a higher level. So it's important. Association is so important. But if we hang out with Shudras, we will be a Shudra. If you hang out with people getting drunk, and I mean, listen, sex, life, you're going to be like that too. Unless you're very determined or extremely detached. I remember when I went to school many years ago that some of my friends were interested in so many crazy things, which I won't mention. And, and they were really, really interested in these different sporting games like football and different things like that. And I just couldn't relate to it in spite of them telling me that I was useless because I didn't know the batting average of, you know, some uh, particular individual. So, the, the, you know, people are attached. That's passion. Passion and ignorance, of course. People are interested in sports and things like that. Oh. And in India, you go and everyone's interested in cricket. One time I was circumambulating Govardhan Hill. And all these children were following me, and, you know, they're, they're nice, but they were teasing me and everything like that. And so then I explained to them that, uh, you know, made up a little lie, that I was an Australian cricket player, and I was getting the blessings of Giriraj to actually uh, win in my next game. And they immediately, oh, my God, please accept our humble obeisances. <laughs> 
Anyway, and those who are less than that, that means less than shudras, are animals or animal life. However, these designations are not permanent. I may be either a Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaisha, or whatever. In any case, this life is temporary. But all life is temporary, and we do not know what we are going to be in the next life. By the spell of this illusory energy, we consider ourselves in terms of this bodily conception of life. And we thus think that we are American, Indian, Russian, Brahmin, Hindu, Muslim, etc. So, of course, we can change our situation by the proper association. There's that story of Viswamitra Muni, or Viswamitra, who was a king, and later on he became a perfect Brahmin. It took a long time. But in the meantime, know what modes of nature your body and psychology are affected by, and just be humble enough to admit that you're not a Brahmin, if you're not. Just be humble and say, yeah, I'm not a Brahmin. Okay, but I can still go back to God, I can still love Krishna, I can still be perfect and everyone's equal. I mean, even Krishna appeared in a Vaishya family. Nothing wrong with that. And Krishna took care of cows. Hmm. And if we become entangled with the modes of material nature, then we forget the Supreme Personality of God who's behind all these modes. So Lord Krishna says the living entities deluded by these three modes of nature do not understand that behind the material background is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There are many different kinds of living entities, human beings, demigods, animals, etc. And each and every one of them is under the influence of material nature, and all of them have forgotten the transcendent personality of Godhead. Those who are in the modes of passion and ignorance, and even those who are in the mode of goodness, cannot go beyond the impersonal Brahman conception of the absolute truth. In one sense, the mode of goodness is the most bewildering because you think everything is all right. Oh, it's so nice, mode of goodness. I am peaceful and I am loving and I'm a vegetarian. Whew. Sometimes it's harder to convince people in the mode of goodness to become devotees than to convince people in the mode of ignorance. Uh, they are bewildered before the Supreme Lord and his personal features, which possesses all beauty, opulence, knowledge, strength, fame, and renunciation. These are the six opulences of Krishna. Krishna has more opulences, but these are the primary ones. He's beautiful. No one is more beautiful than Krishna. More handsome, beautiful, whatever you may call it. No one is richer than Krishna. That's opulence. No one knows more because he knows everything. Past, present, and future. Nothing is unknown to him. Uh, strength, I mean, just like uh, talking about strength, you talk about Ananta Shesh, who lifts up all the planets on his hoods and doesn't even feel it, like grains of mustard seed, like that. And you compare him to someone that, like Atlas, you know, you've heard the story of Atlas, he's holding up the whole world. I mean, not a real person. Atlas is holding up the whole world. He's straining. Fame. Everyone's heard of God. Even the atheists, they talk a lot about him. And Richard Dawkins talks a lot about God. <laughs> and renunciation. Renunciation means he has this whole material world. What is that song? He has the whole world in his hand. He has the whole world in his hand. He has the whole world in his hand. Some of you may not know that song. And that's God. And he never takes, takes advantage of it, never tries to enjoy this world. He's just enjoying loving exchanges with his devotees. He's completely renounced. How many of us are like that? If I offered you a billion dollars, your eyes would light up. Or for you young men, they have some uh, Gandharva, I'm sorry, Apsura, were to walk by you, you would just like faint in ecstasy. Or for you young ladies, if some demigod like Indra was walked before you, or even Ravan would walk before you, just go, wow, I want you. So, <laughs> but Chris is not attracted by anything in this world. He's created, like probably gave you a sample one time, of a uh, person who manufactures sweets confectioner. And so the confectioner is manufacturing all these sweets. So it's not that you 
go to the confectioner and say, I have a present for you, some sweets. What does it mean to him? He's manufactured all of them. I'll give you a practical example in Krishna's pastimes. There's an incarnation of Krishna and Arjuna called Nara and Orion. Okay. And so they meditate in Bhadari Gasha, the expansion and incarnation. And while they're meditating, the demigods, especially Indra, wanted to deter them from their meditation, you know, break their meditation. So he thought the best way to break their meditation is to send down some dancing girls. So he sends down these, they're called apsuras, the dancing girls. They're not the ones who dance for the deities. That's transcendental. You know, if you're a dancer for the deities, that's very nice. Like our dancer here. Uh, Champakalata, Natharani. So anyway, so but these are dancers for for men. You know, like belly dancers. Well, trans not transcendental. Belly dancers from the higher planets. So anyway, it's an inside joke. So uh, they they were sent down by Indra to sort of like destroy the determination of Krishna and Arjuna when they took the form of Narayan. So they were dancing, and also there were favorable breezes. You know, the springtime. Like right now, it's not springtime, but at night or in the early morning, you could hear all the birds chirping, chirp, 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 chirp. It says, you know, springtime, person's fancy turns to love. So you got all the ingredients, the, you know, the fragrances, the sound of the birds, the flowing of a creek. The full moon, the stars in the sky. <laughs> and so all those things were there, along with Cupid. Cupid actually exists. He has bows and arrows. Sometimes I think he has a machine gun, like a M15 or something like that, or a bazooka. So anyway, <laughs> and these arrows are the objects of the senses, you know, like form, taste, smell, oh, like that. <laughs> and so Cupid came down and started firing his arrows, dancing girls, ching, 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 ching. And these two personalities, Krishna and Arjuna and Aaron Ryan Richards, they just yawned. They said, oh, what's this? And then the demigods that is Indra, understood he had made a big mistake. And so he got ready to apologize. He apologized, and Krishna said, all right, if this is what you think is good, then Krishna created a more beautiful dancing girl named Urvasi and said to Indra, take her home with you if you like. Here's a present. So in other words, that shows that everything comes from Krishna. So he's not doesn't need anything in this world. He's Swarad, he's independent, and he gets whatever he wants. So, you know, what is he interested in? What can anybody do for him? Just like they say, you know, what do you buy someone who has everything? But the only thing that person doesn't have is your love and devotion, and that's Krishna. That's the only thing Krishna is missing is your devotion. So anyway, so this is a very interesting explanation. Tomorrow we'll go ahead with text 14. And now we can take some questions after I unmute you. So that was a quite interesting discussion today. So let me unmute everybody so you can ask some questions. Hold on a second. Okay, you are free to ask questions. Who wants to ask a question? Hare Krishna Gurudev. Ah, Hare Krishna. Uh, Gurudev, I have a question about, uh, like you said, you know, that even if someone wants to be atheist, uh, then Krishna provides the intelligence to be, become atheist. But yes. although God knows that this is philosophy is not good for him, <coughs> then why would he encourage uh, that person to be more atheist, you know? Why? Because he, because people have to learn a lesson. You know, if he, if he didn't give them facility 
to exercise their free will, how could they learn their lesson? You know, sometimes the parents will tell, tell the child, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. And then the child will go ahead and do it. And the parents are not going to lock the child up. And so then the child will learn his lesson, come back hopefully to the parents and say, uh, hey, dad, uh, you were right. I shouldn't have done that. Right. So... You know, it's people have to learn by experience. Sometimes you gotta, gotta people give people enough rope to hang themselves. If you understand that expression, very good. Okay. Got to give people enough rope to hang themselves. Otherwise, they won't learn. An intelligent person learns by hearing. But you know, someone who's not so intelligent, okay, I told you what to do. You're gonna do it anyway. Go ahead. Oh my God! Later on, I can tell you, I told you so. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I get I get a lot of satisfaction out of telling people I told you so. <laughs> it's real. It's real blissful. No, not really. I mean, I'd rather people listen. You know, but it, it is a sort of perverse satisfaction telling people, "Yeah, I told you so. I was right." How do you go? Anyway, some people have to learn by doing, some people have to learn by hearing. It's better and more intelligent to learn by hearing. So even those atheists also will eventually learn their lesson and come back to the... Yes. To, back to Krishna. Yeah. People, people eventually, people eventually learn their lesson. But they eventually may be many births. You see that. You know, we know that swapam up yasha dharma should try a tamahatopaya. There's no diminution or loss in devotional service. But personally, I'd rather have my lessons real quick. You know, I'd like to get school over with. You know, some people, they're perpetual students. And some people graduate. I'd like to graduate as fast as possible. Because this school ain't a nice school. Learning through the school of hard knocks, as they say. I mean, the school of Christian consciousness is blissful. But learning by getting kicked is not blissful. You know, it's really, it's like, what do you want to be, a donkey? Anyway, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a donkey. To get kicked, I want to. Anyway, I want to read some books and figure it out, so I don't have to get kicked. All right. Thank you, Gurudev. Thank you, Rishikesh. I I hope you're safe. I heard you got exposed to the virus at one point by your son. No, it's my son. Uh, my son, uh, but he he's he was he he didn't meet us for at least two weeks. He got he was positive this week. But he doesn't All stay right. with me. Yeah, okay. All right, so you just better be careful. Yes, good. I talked to doctors and they say that there is no need for me to test because he doesn't stay with me. And I okay. Do. That's good. Just be careful. It's a dangerous world. I mean, this virus is extremely dangerous. And the government is making it more dangerous for everybody. Be very careful. I mean, we just lost a dear most friend. Yes, Guru. I mean, uh, I absolutely have no symptoms. I mean, I'm taking care of my health. Yes, everybody, please. I mean, Rishi Case just lost his spiritual master. I just lost my dear most friend. And please, be careful, everyone. Please, please, I beg you all. <clears throat> okay, any other questions from anybody? Hi, Krishna Guru. Oh, Zumuk. Yeah. Um, when we uh, do uh, pure devotional service, then slowly, slowly, uh, we, uh, you know, we feel like we're better than others, and the pride comes up, and ego comes up. You know, we try to be better than other 
advanced devotees. So how we get rid of this Gurudev? So good. That, that's actually quite a good question, because according to Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, that's one of the dangers of doing devotional service. You become proud, and you think you're <coughs> you think yourself a controller or advanced devotee. Um, you have to keep reminding yourself that Krishna can take away everything or anything at any time, and Krishna will do that. If you don't remind yourself, Krishna is going to do that. And he'll push your nose in the mud, and then you will remember. <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta keep reminding this: all my talents, all my abilities, everything is coming from Krishna. I don't own anything. Mana Mohajuta Sangha Dosha. And if you don't keep reminding yourself about that, then Krishna will give you a good, good kick in the, whatever. Yeah. Of course, getting kicked by Krishna is kind of nice, but not for the wrong reason. So we, uh, but Krishna cares for us. He'll correct us, like a good parent will correct us in the case that we go off. But you know, I don't want to get smashed again. I don't like getting smashed. It's not a pleasant experience. I'm. Tr I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress getting smashed by Krishna. <laughs> so there I'm going to behave myself. And I love Krishna. Why should I want to do something different? Krishna's so great, and I'm just tiny. I'm just his servant. Okay, thank you. good question. One more question from everybody. Who else has a question? Question, question, question. Nobody else has a question. Oh, Radhasundari, okay. I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, I have a question about humbleness, Gurudev. You mentioned uh, um, uh, all the devotees should have humbleness. But I've noticed because I've always been in a Krishna conscious, you know, I grew up in Krishna conscious family. But I've only always noticed that uh, when you are, I've noticed like other people come into Krishna conscious and people will be humble, but as soon as they get um, initiated, you know, the yeah. humbleness of the devotees, you know, gradually eases, you know. So why do, why do devotees do that? Why do Vaishnavas do that? Well, that's the same point I was just making, that Vishwanath Chakravati says the Bible, that the Narthas can come from pious activities, sinful activities, offenses against devotees or offenses, and they come from the byproducts of bhakti. In other words, by performing bhakti, you get a position, you think you're great, or people praise you, and uh, it creates an anartha. So one has to be very careful about, about these things. Actually, another reason that people get I mean, this is an interesting phenomenon. It's not always the case that people actually act in a non-humble fashion, is that they imitate Prabhupada and great devotees. Like sometimes you'll see very, very great devotees like Prabhupada or Prabhupada's followers, they'll act in an autocratic way. Autocratic means, you know, I'm the boss, you know. And so we have many imitation Prabhupada's in our movement. <laughs> we're supposed to follow in the footsteps of Prabhupada, but we're not supposed to imitate him. So they imitate Prabhupada's mannerisms. I mean, sometimes people even imitate Prabhupada's uh, accent, which is, which is really ridiculous. You know, imitation Prabhupada's. Uh, and what happens is because they, they're not on the level of Prabhupada, obviously. Uh, it's out of false ego. They think that they're on a high level of devotional service. We think we're actually advanced when we're not. We think that we've realized our spiritual identity when we have not. That's the hajjas in the course. So we always like to think more of ourselves uh, than is reality. And that's a danger. So you put parts in, and actually there's a chapter in my book Let's see if I can get my book out. It's called, and this is a quote from Prabhupada, 
that's called, uh, if you go, now I've got to find my glasses. If you go to Lanka, you become Ravana. <laughs> it's actually a very interesting chapter. Uh, so many interesting, everyone should read my book, which is available at no cost. It, probably, probably, that's actually probably saying, Yaya, Yaya, say Lanka, say Hoya Ravan. Anyone who comes to Lanka becomes Ravana. The Bibisha was in Lanka. If you become, Bibisha. in other words, if you if you become in charge of Lanka, you become Ravan. The demoniac qualities come. And here I, I'm quoting here. Actually, it's interesting. I'm quoting from Lord Acton in Great Britain: "Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power tends to corrupt, absolutely." So we see in institutions. I'm reading, reading from me, Dr. Krishna Goswami Ravacha that when power lies in the hands of a single or a few individuals, that corruption and abuse of power are concomitant factors. That's why, that's why really Prabhupada did not want an Acharya for the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, because that's actually what happened with many of his god brothers. Uh, the end result is that those in power tend to view those who they have authority over as objects rather than subjects. In other words, they don't see them as persons with feelings. And this incurs in religious institutions, armed forces, government prisons, and many other places. Hmm. An example, here's an example I give, is Henry Ford. In the beginning of the Ford Motor Company, Mr. Ford treated his workers compassionately as if they were his dear children. And sometimes he made their salaries doubled out of love for him, for them. When the Ford Motor Company grew more and more, he became like a tyrant. So, you know, here's someone with good intentions, of course, not a devotee. And then also I quote a prison experiment that was done by a professor named Zimbardo. And he assigned different students the position of being uh, prisoners and other students the uh, position of being jailers. And the students, even though they were all equal students, because they had these different positions, it went to their heads, and they started to abuse the other students because of the position they had. Wow. And of course, I give a solution. Here's my solution. Right from my book, which everyone should read. The good book. So, one, constant introspection by those on the spiritual path. Two, try to take the perspective of the person you are judging or you are dealing with. If you're the person in power, try to look at the world through their eyes. Three, establish some sort of ombudsman system in a spiritual organization. That means having someone who is assigned simply the duty of creating a good relationship between the management and the workers. And four, do some exercises like team building exercises that include everybody in a particular organization. So this helps create a mood of egalitarianism or equality or love and trust between the devotees. That's why probably he wanted us to go with and stuff like that. And we need a hierarchy in society, otherwise you'll have anarchy. We don't believe in anarchy either. Uh, but as I say, one should have the motto of power with if one's a leader rather than power over. That's good. I got a chance to quote for myself. <laughs> it's available on Amazon. And it's right around on the cover. You can get your copy. Of course, very few people who I've given copies have actually read it and practiced it, unfortunately. I used to give seminars before the coronavirus on these things. And it's really important. So that was a very good question, Radha Sundari. And yes, my experience is that sometimes people become uh, posted, even in the Krishna conscious movement, and they become little Hitlers. Not as bad as Hitler. Yeah, it's good, not good to offend Vaishnavas as well. I yeah, don't like they, they just become little tyrants. 
you know, it, it happens. And not everybody. I mean, there's some very wonderful leaders in our movement. But I've seen so many leaders become like tyrants. You give power to someone and, and then whatever, you know. And then we have to keep remind, reminding ourselves if we actually have a position where people are dependent on us or people are working with us or under us, uh, we have to see things through their eyes and understand that they are just as important as we are in Krishna's eyes. It takes a lot of introspection. Therefore, in a spiritual organization, someone who is not spiritually advanced should not have a position. Because the what will happen is worse than in a business. Because in a business, you know, you have a boss who's real nasty. You quit. That's all. And you go on to another business. But in the Christian conscious movement, if you have a leader who's really nasty and uh, authoritarian, abusive, then you may quit Christian consciousness. I mean, how many devotees have we lost because of leaders who were not empathic, who were not caring for the people, who took as their only duty to be the controller? A kshatriya is interested in protecting others, not just controlling others. Anyway, you got me started. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Guru. I'm sure you use what I just told you against everybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> but my guru said this. Don't. No, I never <laughs> use my guru. <laughs> I, I will never be allowed anywhere in the three worlds if, if people start <laughs> quoting me about things like this. So I'm not using specific names. I mean, uh, let's take the government in America, I could say that. It's like that. You know, where's the concern for the citizens? Just the concern for oneself. The, e the epitome of egotism. Okay, thank you very much. All glorious to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. 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 Jai.